We all know the true superstars of Major League Baseball. You got Otani, you got Trout, you got Ronald Acuna Jr., Mookie Betts, Aaron Judge. You get the point. But that's just the surface level of the league, or the tip of the iceberg, if you will. It's time to take a deep dive into the depths of the iceberg and find some of the best players from the 2023 season that nobody's talking about. The first level of the iceberg was already kind of mentioned, but it is the big guys, the guys who are talked about 90% of the time, and it gets kind of boring. We know who they are and what they do, so let's just move on to level two. In the second level, I guess you could call it the overshadowed tier, there are two players that live at this level, and they are Ha Sung Kim and Bobby Witt Jr. Kim, of course, playing on the Padres, has two things going against him. The team is massively underperforming, and there are bigger names on that roster. But even with a stacked roster, he has been the best player on the team in 2023. Kim has put up 4.6 F4 in the season so far, and that is good for 11th in the league amongst position players. He also has a WRC plus of 129, meaning he is 29% better than the average hitter this year and also is one of the best defensive middle infielders in the entire league. He is getting more attention as the season goes on, but if you ask the casual fan who's having the best season on the Padres, they probably aren't going to say Hassan Kim. Now, Bobby Witt Jr. was a huge prospect. Last year was his rookie year, and it wasn't amazing, but it wasn't bad either. Julio Rodriguez and Adley Rushman kind of took all the attention away from Witt. This year, though, he's having a better season than both of them. He's put a 5.1 F4, and if it wasn't for Shohei Otani, he would be in the MVP conversation in the American League. Corey Seager and Otani are the only two players in the American League with more F4. Now, the problem is that Witt plays on the Royals, who are one of the worst teams in the league and are having one of the worst seasons in their entire history of the franchise. Even though he is one of the best offensive and defensive shortstops in the league, not enough people are talking about how he's having an MVP-type season in his second year in the league. Now, these guys are names almost all baseball fans will know, but they don't really associate them with the top tier of guys, even though they're having outstanding seasons. Now, moving on to tier three, there are two guys here whose names get thrown around here and there, but they aren't in the MVP race or anything, but are still some of the best players in the game. The two players are Nico Horner and Patrick Bailey. With the Dansby Swanson signing in the offseason, Horner's played second fiddle up the middle, that kind of rhymes, well it does rhyme, not kind of, with the Gold Glover, but he has had just as good of a season arguably. Horner makes a lot more contact and gets on base more often than Swanson, but he is definitely lacking in the power department, part of the reason why he is overlooked. Horner shines on defense just like Swanson, but he is also great on the bases. According to Fangraph's base running runs above average, or basically just how good of a base runner you are, Nico Horner is 6th in the entire league. He doesn't strike out, he gets on base at a good rate, and runs the bases really well. All aspects of the game that are sometimes overlooked, but are just as important as the doubles and home runs. Next, we have Patrick Bailey. There's only one place where we can start with him, and that is his defense. He is hands down, in my opinion, the best defensive catcher in the league already, and he has only played 74 Major League games. That is all that really needs to be said. He's racked up 2.6 F4, which is about on pace for 5 if he would play the whole season. He's the best framer in the league and has a 97th percentile pop time, which means he is not only just good at framing, but also at throwing out runners. Hitting-wise, he isn't going to light it up, but he has a WRC Plus of 94 this year. That is below league average in general, but for a catcher, that is above average. He's the best defensive catcher in the league with decent offense? Sign me up! One player stands alone on the next level, and I wish he could be a little bit lower, but his name is kind of getting out there due to some recent events that he's been a part of. Let's take a look at this stat, barrels per plate appearance percent. Now let's just take a look at the leaderboard. This stat may sound a little complicated, but all it really is, is just saying how often does the player hit a hard line drive? How often does the player make good contact and give the ball a chance to, you know, single, double, home run. A lot of that's going to happen when you barrel up a baseball. You got Judge, you got Corey Seager, you got Shohei Otani, you got Jordan Alvarez, Ronald Acuna, Matt Olson. you get the point. These guys are studs, all of them at the tip of the iceberg. But in fourth place, we have a guy that doesn't really fit this trend, and that guy is named Jake Berger. Now, if he wasn't traded at the deadline, he would be a lot lower on the iceberg, but with the trade, he's gotten some attention and it is well-deserved. Now, he doesn't walk all that often and strikes out a fair amount, so he isn't a superstar hitter just yet, but he hits the ball hard and he hits it hard often. And as you can see from this list, if he keeps this up, he will most likely make a name for himself in the big leagues. Now, I hear you. Where are the pitchers? You know I love pitching, so we gotta get some love on here for the pitchers. And there are no better representatives than Tanner Bybee and Cutter Crawford. Now, 
If you don't follow baseball super closely, you might not know what team these guys are on, or you might not even have a clue who they even are. Tanner Bybee was a top 100 prospect coming into the season, ranking 74 in Fangraphs and 55 on MLB Pipeline. Bobby has been pretty good, especially for a rookie this year. He's put up a 3.01 ERA in 119.2 innings of work. He strikes out just about a batter inning with a K per 9 of 8.8, .8, and he walks 2.8 batters per 9, giving him a K per walk of above 3, which is great for a starting pitcher, and he is just 24 years old. While Shane Bieber and Trish McKenzie both struggling with injuries, the Guardians may have found their new ace in Bybee. His best pitch by far is his slider, which he throws about 28% of the time. It has 2.5 more inches of drop than the average slider and has 5.4 more inches of horizontal break than average, which means it's pretty good. Against the slider, opponents are hitting just 210 and the expected batting average off of it is only 193. He often gets lost in the rookie of the year talk amongst bigger names like Gunnar Henderson, Masataka Yoshida, and Josh Young. He will definitely get some votes though, and I wouldn't be surprised if he finishes in the top three for the award. Cutter Crawford is having a similar season to that of Tanner Bybee's. Unsurprisingly, Cutter Crawford throws a cutter. Now, it's not a lights out pitch like a Mariano Rivera or Corbin Burns cutter, but I kind of wish it was, it would kind of fit the brand. But it still is pretty good, and he gets some good movement on it. It still gets hit pretty decently though, with an opposing batting average of 288, so not great, but not awful. His real bread and butter pitch is the four seamer, and it has been the biggest difference for him from last year when he put up a five plus ERA as a rookie. Now, he doesn't throw it all that hard at 93, 94 miles per hour, but he spins it and he spins it well. He's in the 22nd percentile for fastball velocity, but 90th in fastball spin. To put it simply, the more spin a fastball has, the faster it looks and the harder it is to hit, and the numbers support that for Crawford. He throws the four-seamer 39% of the time and holds opponents to just a 173 average and a 346 slugging percentage, not to mention he has a great sweeper and curveball that he gets a lot of chase with. So with those two pitchers out of the way, tier six is going to have even more, and they have six pitchers in this tier. I know, riveting stuff. These guys are even lesser known, mostly because they come out of the bullpen and they aren't closing games. Unless you're a fan of the team that they play for or watch a lot of their games, these pitchers aren't going to get a lot of coverage since they aren't closing games and aren't going to be all-stars, but these guys are just as good and even better than some closers around the league. Now, here are their faces, and I challenge you to name all six of these players. Even if you're a die-hard baseball fan, you are probably going to struggle, and most likely, you're not going to get all six. But, in fact, these are six of the best relievers of the 2023 season. Let's dive into the numbers. And there are their names, too, if you want to check your answers from earlier. If you got all six, you can put it in the comments, but I probably won't believe you anyway. We got Tanner Scott, Joel Pyams, Gabe Spire, Mark Leiter Jr., Josh Spores, and Ryan Walker. The numbers that stand out right away are the strikeouts, and for good reason. For relievers, strikeouts are pretty important. You know, they might come in with a runner on third or second, and the only way to truly guarantee that that runner doesn't score is with a strikeout. Also in common is the walk percentage, with most of these guys posting pretty low numbers. The last thing you want out of a bullpen guy is to come in and start giving up free base runners. And these two things, striking out a lot of people and not walking a lot, shows in their production, as all these ERAs are pretty low, and it's not that surprising seeing all the other numbers. Spores' ERA is a little higher, but his underlying numbers are as good as they get, and I do think that makes him one of the better relievers in this league, and he deserves to be on the iceberg. Things aren't going his way this year. His expected ERA is below 3 at 2.89, which obviously is good and much better than his actual ERA. Now we're getting into the deep depths of the Arctic Ocean, and things can get a little bit weird down here. In these depths, war doesn't exist, batting average doesn't exist, we have to go deeper than that. We have to go deep to find these unsung heroes, these diamonds in the rough. And nobody represents these depths as good as Lamont Wade Jr. Wade doesn't get a lot of attention, even as one of the better players on a playoff contending team. His main strength is his discipline at the plate, and he has a 15.3% walk rate, which is good for ninth in the entire league. He chases just 18.2% of the pitches outside the zone, which is 12th in the entire league. Now, he doesn't have a lot of power, and if he did... He probably would be a star by this point, but he still has put up a WRC plus of 123, which is top 35. You wouldn't think of a Lamont Wade Jr. when you're thinking about the top 35 hitters in the league, but out of the qualified hitters in 2023, he is certainly in the conversation. And it's not like he's only facing righties, you know, a platoon bat, playing against righties only, getting pinched hit for against lefties. He's playing almost every day, he's facing a fair share of lefties, and he's not doing all that well against them, but I've definitely seen worse. 
If you could just hit for a little bit more power and find some consistency against lefties, the league better watch out for Lamont Wade Jr. And now we have finally reached the bottom, the deepest, darkest star of the 2023 MLB season. Now let me break his numbers down for you. He is 12 outs above average, tops in the league at his position, number one, and he probably should win the gold glove this year. He has an average exit velocity of 92.6 miles per hour, which is 18th best in the entire league. And for reference, Fernando Tatis Jr. is 19th and Rafael Devers is 17th. So this guy definitely hits the ball hard. He also has an above average K rate at 20.1%, which is in the 61st percentile. So he plays elite defense, hits the ball as hard as Fernando Tatis Jr. and makes contact a decent amount. So this guy's a superstar, right? Maybe Nolan Arenado, Francisco Lindor, maybe even Matt Chapman. Nope. None of those guys. Actually, this player has never made an all-star team, never won any award, and is in his fourth season in the majors. In the month of August, he's hit to a 306 batting average, 348 on base, and 565 slugging percentage with an OPS of 913. He has a WRC plus of 140 in that span. He has career high in home runs this year, career high in slugging percentage, and looking like he's turning the corner. The player is Niger Morgan. Okay, okay. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That was a joke. Seriously. It's Key Brian Hayes. Yes, Key Brian Hayes, and not many people are talking about him, but I think more people should. Maybe as the Pirates get better, and they are looking like a young competitive team next year, he could get more attention. And the Pirates have him on arguably one of the best contracts in the league in my opinion, well, maybe behind Ronald Acuna Jr., but he's getting paid $70 million over 8 years, which is an average of just $8.75 million per year. There's a team option in the ninth year for 12 million, so this contract takes up three free agent years, but it could be possibly four if the team decides to execute the option. His main problem though in the past has been his launch angle. He's always hit the ball hard, he just hits it right into the ground. This year, the launch angle has been improved a little bit and he's got a career high in home runs, as mentioned before, career high in slugging percentage, and is the best defensive third baseman in the league. If he continues this trend, then I don't know, it may be a high bar, but Nolan Arenado 2.0? I don't know, kind of sounds crazy when you say that, but numbers are there behind the scenes. If he gets the launch angle fixed, which it looks like it's coming around the past month, he's been one of the best hitters in the league. So maybe someday he will be at the top of the iceberg with the big guns up there. Maybe Lamont Wade Jr. will be too. Maybe they all will, but that is it. The iceberg has been explained and my work here is done. And bounced and a fair ball and a long throw for Hayes. <laughs> 